Okay, to kick things off then, we have a session on promoting economic integration in South Asia. And I'm delighted to welcome Ambassador Gautam Bambavale, the convener of AED. Could I invite you to the stage, please? Please give him a big round of applause. Ambassador Bambavale's journey began in the corridors of China affairs at the Ministry of External Affairs. His path led him to the pivotal positions in Berlin, Beijing, and Washington, D.C. As Consul General in Guangzhou and Ambassador to Bhutan, he etched lasting imprints on East Asian relations. And today he stands before us a bridge builder, a diplomat, and a visionary. And I'd like to welcome onto the stage uh, Ambassador uh, Vinay Mohan Quatra, Foreign Secretary, Government of India. Please give him a big round of applause. With 32 years of service, Ambassador Quatra's expertise spans continents. From Ambassador to France and Nepal, to heading the Americas Division, he has navigated the intricate currents of international re relations. Today, he brings his wisdom to our table where India's interests converge with global aspirations. I'd also like to welcome Ambassador Seva Lamsal. Please give her a big round of applause. History was made on the 15th of December 2023 when Sewa Lamsal became Nepal's first female foreign secretary. Her, her two de decade long journey from ambassador to Pakistan to deputy permanent representative to the UN speaks of resilience, leadership and a commitment to diplomacy. She stands as a beacon for all aspiring diplomats. Ambassador, welcome. And finally, Ambassador Masood bin Momen, Foreign Secretary, Bangladesh. Please give him a big round of applause. Notably, Ambassador Momen served as Bangladesh's ambassador to the UN, Japan, and Italy, with a career spanning various diplomatic capacities including roles in New Delhi, Kathmandu, and Islamabad. His leadership and expertise persist in molding Bangladesh's foreign policy on the global platform, reflected in his ongoing impact in diplomatic services. So together, we delve into the heart of economic integration. Remember, our neighbors are not distant strangers. They are our immediate family. Their prosperity is our prosperity and let this session ignite ideas, forge connections, and set the stage for a more integrated, resilient South Asia. Ambassador Gautam, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vandana, and thank you to uh, the three dignitaries on stage. Let's have another round of applause for the three foreign secretaries of India, Nepal, and Bangladesh. Ambassador Quatra, perhaps I should start with you. Um, let me first ask you to uh, deliver some opening remarks as the uh, driving force behind this conference. The Ministry of External Affairs has always been very supportive of our efforts. But also let me bundle that question with uh, the issue of geoeconomics being in a state of flux. How has India come through the crises, the multiple crises that we have experienced over the last few years. So let me ask you on both those um, issues to give us your views. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Gautam, if you permit, I would uh, start by recognizing uh, the president of the Pune International Center, Dr. Mashilka, the vice president, uh, Dr. Vijay Kelkar, uh, Ambassador Lata Reddy, my former boss, uh, Ambassador Gautam Bambawale himself, my colleagues on the panel, uh, Foreign Secretary uh, Seva Lamsal of uh, Nepal and Foreign Secretary Momen of Bangladesh, uh, other serving and retired senior officials of Government of India, uh, present here this afternoon, my colleagues from the Ministry, uh, Secretary Kumaran and uh, Joint Secretary Raghu. Uh, first of all, a 
a big thank you to uh, to the organizers of the Pune International Center for giving me and the ministry this opportunity to uh, speak to this distinguished gathering in Pune. Uh, I last visited Pune roughly 41 years ago, I think sometime way back in 81, 82. Um, I have aged, city has modernized, so I really can't position the, uh, uh, the places that I saw 41 years ago very clearly. Uh, but uh, this morning I had an opportunity to go around the town and it was uh, a wonderful, receptive uh, uh, city that I experienced. Um, I think the remarks that the Honorable External Affairs Minister um, made in his video address and the, um, and the sketch of challenges that Dr. Mashilkar outlined in his remarks. I think that clearly uh, broadly forms the framework of uh, uh, challenges, if you call them challenges in that respect that we face. Um, I could decipher four of them very clearly from minister's remarks, which were essentially the supply chain challenge one, uh, technology challenge, uh, I would also course like to see the opportunities on the side of technology also. Uh, I see that in the program you are talking about generative intelligence tomorrow, which is a very fascinating field of uh, opportunities uh, uh, which are there. Uh, overcrowding, over concentration of supply chains, the third. Market dominance, uh, whether it is of products, services, or technology, uh, fourth. And the challenges that Dr. Mashilkar listed, job disruptions, uh, global uh, mobility disruption, I would rather call it. The climate change and the associated challenges, uh, income inequalities, trade tensions, uh, cross-border investment related issues, and the aging population. Uh, somewhere along this list, uh, if you allow, I would also mention the one which we all experienced, which was the once-in-century pandemic. Uh, the kind of economic contraction that the COVID pandemic caused globally, uh, the uh, kind of uh, uh, deceleration uh, in the economic growth that it caused, the demand destruction of imported products that it caused uh, presented a kind of, you know, as I said, once in a century kind of challenge and a challenge of, from which several economies of the world are yet to fully recover. Uh, speaking of it in our own context, uh, we are all aware of uh, uh, the human uh, tragedy human tragedy and the human cost and the economic cost that we faced because of COVID in the country. Uh, but also the resilience of the country to bounce back after that pandemic and recover the way in which we have recovered. When we talk of geoeconomics and the, and the global flux essentially, uh, yes, there is a framework of reference of challenges from which we can look at, especially if you look at conflicts, whether it is the ongoing Russia-Ukraine conflict or the conflict in Gaza and the associated disruptions caused by that, whether it is food, fuel, fertilizer, supply chain insecurities, cost of crude, cost of energy, in some cases cost of capital going up. Yes, that is definitely one frame of reference in which we can look at and we have to because there is a, a strong mitigation angle required there by each country. But I think geoeconomics in many ways, uh, especially in a state of flux, also presents a certain set of opportunities for, especially for countries like India. Uh, and I will 
take a tangent and draw it uh, to the point which uh, the minister mentioned, that when globally the countries are looking for one country risk diversification uh, from particular geographies where the supply chains are concentrated, where the market access is leveraged or weaponized, uh, where whether it is brownfield or it is greenfield, uh, capital is looking for reliable uh, destinations which can offer them strong returns on the equity. Uh, if, you, if you triangulate those variables, you will find that this translates into and has been benefited uh, by immensely to the Indian economy and for India. So while I can draw a comparative matrix going back to 2014, but if you were to look at simply the post-COVID economic growth patterns, uh, I wouldn't say even year by even, even if you look at quarter by quarter that we have registered, they tell a story in themselves, those numbers. And that story is not just of headline numbers. Uh, those, everybody knows, I mean, we were 10th largest in 2014. We became 5th largest last year. We are aiming to be third largest in three years' time from now. Uh, and if all goes well, the current uh, 3.7 trillion uh, GDP of India could well be 7.3 trillion by the end of 2030. Uh, so if you, if you look at those headline numbers, and particularly if you combine them with, a, with two very important other matrices which are, uh, which are crucial to, uh, to keep in mind when it comes to uh, economic growth stories. One, uh, uh, a fairly strong control over inflation. The average uh, yearly inflation figure roughly around, uh, don't hold me to these statistics, but it's roughly around 5% for last 10 years. Uh, the years preceding that were hovering between 8 to 9%. The second uh, number which is important to keep in mind is in terms of how the world looks at us and how that perception and assessment of India translates into actual evidence. Uh, and the and the strongest evidence of that is the FDI inflows into the Indian economy. I won't even talk of portfolio flows because that's a different kind of capital. Uh, but FDI flows where, which from 2014 till now have been roughly to the tune of close to $600 billion. And the beauty of it is that a large chunk and substantial chunk of it has actually come post-COVID. Uh, so it tells you uh, how uh, it's, a, it's a manifestation of how the world assesses India in terms of uh, opportunity, not just opportunity arising out of political and policy stability, but also opportunity uh, which for them is a sheer economic and business opportunity. Uh, uh, and policy and political stability flows directly out of that. Uh, I would also uh, mention one more thing, which is beyond the headline numbers, that if one was to analyze uh, India's economic growth story of last 10 years, uh, I think one should look at the very comprehensive nature of the drivers of these growth and the and the end objectives that we have so far been able to achieve and look forward to kind of uh, building on them going forward. So if you were to look at the entire space of infrastructure, you can take each, take each piece of infrastructure and spend a full day of discussing various elements of it. But just look at the airports, the railway sector, the roads and the port infrastructure. Uh, 
you're all aware of the numbers, but uh, 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 we are expecting uh, from roughly 70 odd airports pre-2014 to already at 142 airports and maybe 70 more in pipeline. So looking at that. Second crucial part of which, which, which links directly to infrastructure is the logistics. Uh, the extent of logistics load onto the GDP is very important uh, to keep in mind if, if our journey is to continue and Prime Minister is very strongly focused on it. Uh, so if you look at the national logistics policy which was, uh, which was launched recently, our target is to move logistics cost to roughly 8 to 9 percent of the GDP by 2030, which is what the global benchmarks are, which is what we experience in the developed countries. Current costings of logistics cost to the GDP um, uh, are on the higher side. Now, the extent of economic gains, the efficiency gain that unleashes within the economy, uh, and not just in our own national economy, but, but across the entire region, because of the logistical chains that are there throughout the region, is something to be kept in mind. Three, the, the digital intensity of economic growth. So the digital public infrastructure, it is very easy to kind of uh, take it as something which, which comes to you, delivered in a package, and as a user case, we benefit from it. But there is a very strong a visionary element of digital public infrastructure that is behind this in terms of Prime Minister's vision. And that is what is making it pretty much an ubiquitous thing in terms of whichever sector of economy you look at it. Uh, combine this with one more element which is a strong uh, external element for us to, to focus on, which is how the world looks at the leadership of the country, the politics of the country, the policy stability of the country, uh, and its orientation. Uh, I think the world clearly sees uh, in our Prime Minister a very strong leader, a leader committed to national growth, a leader also, as the, uh, uh, as the Master of Ceremony just mentioned, uh, looks at the regional prosperity inherently linked to the, uh, to the national economic growth. And I think world not just sees it for what the leader is, but also assesses that through the policies that are announced and policies that we see, uh, whether it is in our neighborhood, and we can come to that and speak about that in detail in terms of neighborhood first policy, uh, uh, or it is in terms of what we are doing within the country which has very strong externalities of benefit for the foreign participants. I think all this comes together uh, uh, in a package uh, that, is, uh, uh, that, that presents a picture of strength, a uh, picture of hope and optimism, a uh, picture of evidence-based uh, growth story, which is for the national good but also a story in which the international community, particularly the international business community, sees a very, very strong benefit in this. I think, let me uh, stop here for now uh, and come back to you later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Quatra. Uh, I'd like to turn to you now, Ambassador Lamsal, and ask you a similar question, which is how is the Nepalese economy doing? But before you come to that, let me ask you, is this your first visit to Pune? You've been around the city in this, this morning. What are your impressions? What impressions will you take back with you to Kathmandu? And then tell us about how the Nepalese economy is doing. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me begin by extending my sincere uh, thanks to the host of this event, uh, President of Pune International Center, uh, Vice President of Pune International Center, Convener of AED 2024, Ambassador Gautam Bambawale, uh, Foreign Secretary Binay Mohan Kwatra Saab, 
Foreign Secretary of Bangladesh, uh, uh, and distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, let me uh, respond to your question that uh, I came to New Delhi and then I had good meetings. Uh, I paid a courtesy call on Honorable External Affairs Minister and I had good, meet, good meeting uh, with uh, the Foreign Secretary of India. And uh, yesterday I just arrived and then this morning I visited Saniwarwada, a very historic place of Pune. And I'm thrilled to see that place. Very magnificent place. I, I heard a lot about that place. And then the, uh, uh, again, I, I had another opportunity to visit uh, Symbiosis uh, Simbias, Simbias International Center this morning, where our uh, over 700 students are studying there. And this is another place, place of Basudaiba uh, Kutumbakam in real terms. We talk a, talk a lot of talks about Basudaiba Kutumbakam, but this is the place where you can see what is uh, really mean Basudaiba Kutumbakam. I'm really impressed and then thank you very much for this arrangement also. Uh, uh, to your questions, yes, uh, I agree with the panelist. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, the master of ceremonies she, uh, said the stage very well and also the president of Pune International Center, he also articulated so many issues, and then yourself, Ambassador Gautam Bamawale. Yes, uh, it was a difficult time, particularly due to COVID pandemic, followed by the wars and conflicts uh, across the region, and then that, uh, that hampered a lot to the landlocked economy like Nepal. So I just want to give a brief overview of what we were doing before uh, pre-COVID uh, situation. So our economic growth and everything, other economic indicators was at a very good situation. But after that, it took a while to recover. It went down, the economy went down, and the growth rate, uh, sluggish growth rate we had to face. And then now, uh, the 2024, IMF has projected that there will be 5% growth, and the government has estimated that there will be 5 to 6% growth. That means our economy is getting momentum. That is due to the reform policies of the government of Nepal, so that, uh, that are focused on uh, policy reforms, procedural reforms, and many other areas where we have to look into. And then we have uh, applied stringent uh, uh, monetary policy that also helped a lot to save and the, to bring the economy to this stage. The other, other important factors that contributed to our economy is uh, energy sector. Uh, energy, Nepal has huge potential of uh, energy and hydropower generation capacity. So uh, that is one area uh, where I will uh, discuss later. I think uh, on, I have another topic to discuss later on. And we have also agricultural sector that we, uh, we put focus on. And likewise, we have tourism sector uh, that also is, and, uh, has come to, uh, pre, to pre-COVID situation now. So our uh, tourism is uh, coming back and also other macroeconomic uh, indicators such as uh, foreign reserve exchange and then uh, remittance inflow and the inflation uh, we have control over in inflation also. So I think all those eco indicators have given good impression. So our economy is on the right track. Uh, there are many areas where we can uh, uh, focus on and then integrate into the de regional development also and in the region. I think uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, other, other uh, areas such as uh, uh, migrant workers and uh, that is also another part that, that is also contributing lo a lot to our economy. So I think those are the basic uh, uh, macroeconomic indicators which have shown good, good and positive results, positive indication to our economy and uh, that gives us a good uh, boost to move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much Ambassador Lamsal. Um, perhaps I should turn to Ambassador Masood bin uh, Momin of Bangladesh. Um, sir, I'd like to, of course, give you the opportunity to also fill us in 
and talk to us a little bit about how the Bangladesh economy is doing. But also let me dive into this whole issue of South Asian economic integration. South Asia is looked upon as one of the least integrated regions of the world uh, as compared to the European Union or compared to the Association of Southeast Asian Nations or compared to the North, uh, North America Free Trade Agreement area, which is Canada, the United States and Mexico. Um, Intra-regional trade in South Asia is a mere 5% of total trade and intra-regional investment is a mere 1% of, uh, of total investment. So if I could request you to also uh, talk to us a little bit about the Bangladesh economy, how it's doing and what should we be doing to increase trade and investment amongst ourselves within the region. Ambassador. Uh, moment, please. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Gautam, the uh, convener of this uh, Asia-Pacific uh, dialogue, and also the president and the vice president of uh, PIC in presence and the dignitaries, and also uh, uh, my uh, fellow panelists, uh, Foreign Secretary of uh, India and Nepal. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, PIC for inviting me in this uh, important uh, forum, uh, which is being held uh, regularly uh, now. And uh, why not uh, Davos uh, in Pune? Uh, uh, as you have uh, rightly mentioned, the intra-regional trade in South Asia is uh, one of the uh, lowest, uh, perhaps uh, slightly over uh, 5%, maybe 5.8%, uh, whereas the EU is uh, 27% and ASEAN is 15%. Uh, now, uh, there are many reasons uh, we uh, uh, have to look back. Uh, if we go back uh, 19, uh, be be before 1947, the whole area was, uh, of course, uh, seamlessly connected, uh, but now it's a totally different uh, uh, scenario uh, geographically and uh, politically. Uh, as far as uh, Bangladesh economy is concerned, uh, as you'll be happy to know that currently it is the 35th largest uh, economy in the world, uh, although the land mass is very small, and uh, we have a population of uh, 170 million uh, with a thriving middle class. And the growth rate that we have been experiencing, uh, uh, apart from uh, the you know couple of years uh, with COVID, it was uh, more than seven percent. Now it is a little bit of over six percent, and we will be the ninth largest uh, uh, consumer market by 2030. So these are uh, quite uh, impressive numbers uh, if you consider our past and our history. Uh, and uh, today it is a 40, uh, 480 billion dollar uh, economy. Uh, now, uh, how to uh, you know, uh, navigate in this uh, era of flux? And Bangladesh is also being affected uh, first, of course, with the COVID uh, and then uh, the Ukraine war, as mentioned, and, and the Gaza crisis and the Red Sea uh, you know, uh, <coughs> disturbances of supply disruptions. And the uh, triple F problem that was mentioned by Ambassador Quatra, the food, uh, fertilizer, and fuel, because we uh, uh, import mo most of our fuel and uh, a lot of our fertilizer uh, from uh, other sources. Uh, given this uh, scenario, uh, we have uh, you know, one advantage uh, to our side, and that is uh, we have the advantage of numbers. Uh, whatever big infrastructure projects uh, we have undertaken so far, they're already being paid up. I mean, uh, just uh, give one example, the Padma Multipurpose Bridge which is a 6.5 kilometer long bridge built uh, entirely with our own uh, resources, $3.6 billion. Uh, it was a very uh, bold and courageous uh, uh, decision by Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. And uh, it has connected uh, almost the eight of the district in the south uh, with millions of uh, people living there. And it is said that, uh, uh, of course, it is uh, <coughs> to be... Uh, seen and uh, proved that uh, it will add 1% plus to our GDP. That means we were growing at the rate of uh, 6.5 or 7%, so it could be around 7 plus uh, percentage points. Now, uh, I often talk about this opportunity that uh, with our uh, Bangladesh population and uh, of course India has a, a huge population and Nepal and uh, <coughs> Bhutan uh, being landlocked in our region and uh, seven uh, uh, states of Northeast India, which are also landlocked. So if we consider this whole region 
And then uh, if we can improve the connectivity, not just the physical connectivity in terms of uh, railway networks or uh, road networks, but also the ancillary services, the customs points, the, the immigration points, and uh, all the border arrangements. If we can have that, plus the people-to-people -people connectivity, the, the grid connectivity, and also uh, internet connectivity. So given all these connectivities, if we can uh, uh, you know, put uh, dots and connect the dots, then you know, I was once upon a time a student of economics, so I can easily show that there is potential of uh, adding uh, two or three percentage points. So it is not a pipe dream that uh, our Prime Minister uh, has been telling that by 2041, the 70th year of our independence, uh, we uh, can reach uh, a, a sort of a developed country uh, status. It is theoretically possible. Of course, uh, again, you know, uh, first year economics, uh, ceteris paribus, that we don't have uh, no more, uh, you know, uh, uh, COVID-like situation or other uh, external shock. Uh, energy can be another uh, point uh, which uh, can be highlighted. Uh, uh, Bangladesh's uh, current production capacity is about 25,000 megawatts. But with, uh, to sustain the 7% economic uh, growth, uh, we will be uh, having a lot of demand. And the demand estimates are about 60,000 me uh, megawatts by 2041. So obviously, uh, we ourselves will not be able to produce uh, that kind of energy, uh, given the fact we don't have uh, much gas or oil or, or uh, coal. Uh, therefore, we have to look uh, beyond the uh, you know, uh, geographic limits. Uh, one good opportunity is uh, Nepal and Bhutan. Uh, their combined potential capacity uh, is about 70,000 megawatts. So obviously, there is enough uh, to go around. Already, uh, we are importing some from Tripura and uh, some from Nepal, but uh, with uh, proper transmission lines over India, uh, we can uh, have a win-win situation for all of us. And another point I'd like to just highlight that uh, we are uh, building a number of uh, uh, seaports, uh, one at Matarbari, which is a deep seaport, and Matarbari uh, to the northeastern states, uh, say Tripura, not very far. Uh, there is this uh, Feni Moitri Bridge, which was inaugurated jointly by uh, Prime Minister Modi and uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. So uh, from there, you can easily come to uh, Matarbari and northeastern state uh, 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 trade, uh, traders have shown uh, a lot of interest to use that port. So with uh, northeastern states, with Nepal and Bhutan, uh, so it would be, a, again, another very lucrative proposition for all of us. So there are, uh, you know, and then there are waterways and other uh, means also uh, for uh, taking uh, goods uh, through the waterways uh, uh, up in the rivers uh, from Silet to, uh, from Kumilla to other Indian states. Uh, with the kind of uh, leadership uh, vision that uh, currently uh, being uh, displayed both by Prime Minister Narendra Modiji and Prime Minister Sina uh, Modiji mentioning that this is a kind of a golden chapter in our history. So obviously, uh, if we can uh, do our best in utilizing all these, uh, there are a lot of hope uh, for not only Bangladesh, but for the entire region uh, or the sub-region. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Moment. And thank you very much for your uh, proactive and, and optimistic outlook that South Asia could uh, become a region which is very well connected, which is very well economically integrated. Uh, Ambassador Quatra, you mentioned India's neighborhood first policy. And India is also a major, uh, uh, it, it provides development assistance to its neighboring countries. So uh, could I request you to uh, describe our neighborhood first policy, to talk a little bit about it, and also, if you could share with us some of the big success stories of development assistance that India has done in its immediate neighborhood. Ambassador Quatra. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Bambiwale. Uh, you know, before I come to that, let me go to the uh, opening point uh, that you made uh, with regard to the extent of intra-regional trade, 5% or, uh, and that too in a comparative frame of reference, uh, 
vis-a-vis uh, -vis ASEAN and, and Europe. Uh, I, uh, I, I would not disagree with you that that is definitely one frame of reference in which uh, one can examine whatever is happening in terms of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, economic cohesion within South Asia. Um, that definitional view essentially then takes you to certain outcomes that that particular view would want, which is smooth flow of goods, services, capitals, uh, more integrated, deeply integrated supply chains within the region. That's the outcome that uh, uh, from that frame of reference you would reach uh, if you were to uh, take that into account. I think the way it is happening in the region and in South Asia and especially if you look at the evidence of it, we are in a way uh, uh, approaching it from a different direction which is that we are directly focusing on the outcomes. Uh, perhaps in the process, not necessarily being purist about the definitional aspect of it. Um, and this happens at multiple levels. This happens uh, in our bilateral relationships within South Asia. It also happens in the regional institutional frames of reference. Uh, and uh, uh, contrary to what people would think, uh, many of these uh, achievements that the regional associations have uh, been able to uh, succeed in obtaining have been greatly instrumental in, in, uh, in forging a stronger uh, South Asian connectivity. Uh, so if you were to, if I was to take forward what uh, my colleague, Foreign Secretary of Bangladesh, spoke about connectivity. Uh, and I'm taking this as a first element of uh, Prime Minister's neighborhood first policy approach. Uh, when we look at South Asia, when we look at our neighborhood first, uh, I think it's, it's at three levels. Uh, the first is a level of belief that we have in it. And the key anchor there is the people the people centricity of whatever we do. Uh, second is at the policy level. We come to then neighborhood first policy. And third is the implementation that how this belief through policy then gets implemented across various domains. And one of the domains which, uh, which uh, uh, Foreign Secretary Moment referred to is the connectivity domain. Now, when you look at connectivity within our region, you will probably find it essentially of four, 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 four types, basically. One, the physical one, you know, infrastructure, uh, um, uh, rail links, road links, uh, etc. The second, which is probably a newly emerging space, is domain connectivity. So, for example, Foreign Secretary spoke about, Foreign Secretary Moment spoke about, power trade. Uh, I can give you a very real life example and uh, uh, my colleague Foreign Secretary of Nepal will, will testify to that. Two years ago uh, uh, was a, uh, you know, a very significant uh, uh, landmark point in India-Nepal relationship when for the first time, uh, two, two and a half years ago I think, uh, the first project was approved under the CBT guidelines of India, allowing Nepal to export 30 megawatts of power to India. It was just two and a half years ago, not long ago. Uh, why I say this to be a significant landmark? Because till then, hitherto, Nepal had been a net importer of power from India. That was the first time that Nepal exported 32 megawatts of power. And I remember at that time, the, the general uh, perception was that, look, it's only 32 megawatts, uh, so we'll see how this goes in. Uh, on today's date, uh, when we speak, Nepal is exporting to India in excess of 600 megawatts of power. This is just in last two and a half, three years. 
uh, and this is a classic example of how the power trade uh, which is a regional trade incidentally because a lot of power gets sold on the IEX exchange in India. So it is not a G to G purchase. It is a purchase which is made by a private sector player in India and supplier is uh, a private sector project in Nepal. We similarly have gone through an experimental phase wherein I think uh, we are looking at a pilot phase of power being exported from Nepal to Bangladesh through the Indian grid. Precisely the example that Foreign Secretary Momin spoke about. Uh, and I think there is a, there, there's a crucial piece which is, which, is, which is missing in this, which is important for us to uh, fill that gap, which is the transmission line network. So between India and Nepal, for example, we have a fairly extensive high voltage transmission network which allows power evacuation to take place on both sides. Uh, and this is not a function of border uh, restrictions, tariff problems, etc. Uh, if we were to build similar uh, uh, evacuation infrastructure facilities between India and Bangladesh, you will suddenly find that not just uh, power trade between India and Bangladesh would increase, power trade in our entire region would, uh, uh, you know, jump exponentially, I would say. Uh, we are all aware that uh, we are also looking um, to build uh, 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 grid capacities between India and Sri Lanka, uh, not just of power, uh, but also of the product pipelines. And if all goes well, even the land bridge border connectivity. So connectivity, you know, is of domains also. A newly emerging field is financial connectivity. And the market spaces in the region being linked through e-commerce. So for example, uh, I think there is currently an arrangement between two private sector players, between India and Nepal, where uh, the uh, products of, of each other e-commerce websites can be sold uh, on the other website. And since the supply chains, at least uh, in the, on the land border countries between India, Nepal and India, Bangladesh, are reasonably well connected, uh, the, the, the cost of uh, logistics is, is not an issue. Uh, the third thing, there's more in the services space which is happening, is in the fintech interoperability. Uh, whether it is through the rupee-based trading platforms, which is yet to take off in a major way, but on a pilot basis, yes. But also the financial payment uh, platforms, the way they, they speak to each other. So there is a, you know, there are new emerging spaces. The Startup Connect, there is a fair bit of robust connectivity between the startup uh, uh, ecosystem in, uh, in the countries of South Asia and India. And it is mutually reinforcing. It's not a government is only an enabler. It's all done and uh, led by the private sector. Uh, I mentioned people. People are central to this connectivity. And our effort is that there should be not just seamless movement of goods, capital, technology, services uh, within South Asia, but of course, the people first and foremost. There is a last element of connectivity which I should point out, which... Uh, uh, Foreign Secretary Momin uh, hinted to in terms of what's going on in Bangladesh, which is connectivity uh, enhancement and building within the country as it links to the region. So India's massive thrust on building connectivity uh, with northeast uh, of India, that automatically then gives a, a different uh, uh, paradigm jump to the way we connect to the uh, to the, in terms of our Act East uh, uh, initiative and approaches. The, uh, the rails uh, network is another one. We are trying to go back to roughly uh, pre-independence six rail line network uh, between India and Bangladesh, two railway line networks between India and Nepal. We are working on two with uh, Bhutan also. We are also looking at increasingly a space uh, of connectivity which refers to regulatory convergence in terms of the uh, trade systems. 
um, and uh, in case of uh, uh, at least Nepal and Bangladesh, the petroleum product pipelines, which have uh, enormously uh, uh, brought in economic efficiency gains when it comes to trade in uh, petroleum and petroleum products. So the result is all of all of this has reduced itself into specifics, which is what the outcome of a definitional framework is, which is that the regional supply chains within South Asia are now better uh, uh, connected in, in, in terms of the trade flows, the capital flows, uh, and the market linkages. There is ease of mobility. I won't say quantum of mobility, I'll say ease of mobility of goods, services, and capital. Uh, creation of economic gains, it is quite sort of natural in this. You talked about the development partnership template that we have. It is a very essential and a crucial element of India's neighborhood first policy. So roughly 50% uh, of uh, uh, our lines of credit and pretty much 80% of our grant expenditure, uh, which goes out, is dedicated as part of neighborhood first policy. I would, uh, I would expand this to the maritime domain of neighborhood first and pro probably include uh, Mauritius uh, also in, in, in this segment. Uh, I refer to ICPs in the beginning. I think this is again um, something which must be flagged. We currently have uh, uh, seven ICPs that are uh, in place working. We are constructing two more and there are 13 more in pipeline. ICPs are integrated check posts. Integrated post. check post. And I'll give you one example. In 2014, uh, if you look at India's trade figures with uh, Bangladesh, India's trade figure with Nepal, uh, I think India's trade figure with Nepal was roughly around four to five billion dollars and I think with Bangladesh it was six to seven. The numbers are now tripled pretty much in the last, last 10 years. And a lot of this is because of these integrated check posts which bring in uh, trade efficiency gains, the quantum of trade increases, uh, new market for products get created where there was none initially. Uh, and I will, I will take this and then uh, take you to what's happening institutionally. Uh, many people forget that the, uh, the SAFTA agreement, the South Asian Free Trade Agreement, and the uh, SATIS, what we call South, Africa, South Asian Trade of Agreement in Services, which was more based on the GATS platform, was one of the first institutional arrangements within South Asia that allowed for tariff-free movement pretty much on agreed tariff lines within the region. Uh, of course, in case of uh, India-Nepal, India-Bhutan, it didn't apply because India-Bhutan Treaty and India-Nepal Treaty were SAFTA plus or SATIS plus in that nature. But there are institutional mechanisms in place and now more of them, BIMSTEC, BBIN, which essentially, uh, you know, lead to those objectives which one would uh, want to see in a more uh, integrated, cohesive, uh, a connected region. So, terminologically, I will say a more connected South Asia, you know. So, connected region, uh, connecting people, uh, that's the central thing uh, behind neighborhood first and linking, of course, uh, you know, uh, prosperity of each other uh, into a regional prosperity context. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Quatra. So, I, I would, my takeaway is that things are looking very, very positive. The groundwork and the infrastructure is being laid for a more integrated, economically integrated South Asia. And even where trade and investment is concerned, we'll see this moving up very soon. Ambassador Lamsal, you mentioned energy cooperation between India and Nepal. Uh, Ambassador Quatra also spoke about this and with Bangladesh also. Um, so could you speak a little bit more about energy cooperation, hydropower cooperation, how it has developed? Uh, in the last few years, Ambassador Quatra just mentioned a few um, uh, statistics on this, but could you explain to us how hydropower cooperation and energy cooperation between India and uh, uh, Nepal and India and also with other parts of South Asia has developed in the last few years? Uh, so thank you very much. I would also like to speak uh, something about connectivity. Of course, uh, our region is a region of hope, region of happening things. 
so it's it gives a lot of attention to a lot of people uh, for so many reasons so we have huge potential so you have potential of hydropower potential of water resources potential of agriculture potential of human resources we have active uh, uh, and and then uh, young youth population young population uh, that is another asset uh, we have uh, that we we are yet to capitalize i, I think and then we have also uh, we we have tried to connect uh, get connected in the region but uh, uh, in my view i think the whole of connectivity is yet to harness that means uh, connection connectivity by road by air by rail i mean, I mean uh, infrastructure by investment by business by trade uh, and so on because uh, we have to see whole of the connectivity and that's that's how we we, we will be fully uh, connected and we can uh, uh, share our prosperity uh, between us i think uh, this region uh, no need to say that we are less integrated but i think this is the right time when we have to uh, also reflect on why we are less connected so that why is very important in my view so let's let's also reflect on uh, that part and then just move forward uh, collectively for uh, our collective prosperity uh, uh, definitely uh, nepal treasures huge potential of uh, uh, hydropower and water resources uh, we have started actually the last uh, uh, prime minister our right honorable prime minister visit actually gave the policy space and by which we could able to sign mou in january last month uh, that is about uh, power long term power trade agreement of 10000 megawatt within 10 years time that is huge 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 uh, foundation in our relationship so um, but uh, the point is timely implementation of the agreement is very very important likewise we have also uh, inked to export 40 megawatt uh, electricity to bangladesh we are working on that that is another another big step that we have taken recently and that is i think uh, a sustainable way of uh, integration when we talk about uh, integration that is also very very important because uh, we we have to look into uh, our our trade uh, our trade deficit our uh, our uh, people's uh, i mean uh, i mean to say uh, connectivity in regards to people's mobility so our region also treasures uh, cultural heritage we have uh, colors we have peoples we have culture we have shared values shared beliefs and then shared festival we have uh, we have a strong soft power so we, we can also connect through those soft powers and uh, also uh, other 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 areas for example uh, financial integration complete financial integration and also we have policy space we have so many policies that we are yet to give sap and then through that we can get benefit of it uh, so we have to uh, believe in collective prosperity so i think uh, we are in that regard we, we, we are heading to, towards that direction uh, but uh, we have to uh, give a little more attention to that uh, that part uh, i think uh, we are doing a little by little, but uh, if we uh, really carry the spirit of uh, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. That means if we integrate whole of our South Asian, uh, our, our region's potential, that means we will get better and more. So uh, I think we have to focus on that. And also we have uh, one of the uh, world... Uh, institutions regional institutions we have we, we also have to uh, utilize those infrastructure those those uh, those space those those structures as well so uh, for example sark beamstick and other other bbin uh, we have also ec mode we have there are many other other such organizations where we can uh, we can work together because if we uh, talk about uh, sustainable development goals 
that that is this is the reason where sustainable development achievement of sustainable goals is very very important so that uh, the poverty elevation and the, the goals of uh, goals and targets of sustainable development goals will also be achieved i think uh, being a landlocked country we uh, we highly value uh, connectivity connectedness and con uh, connection so in that regard we are looking forward to work with uh, our our neighbor uh, india and bangladesh uh, we have started this, that engagement and I think based on that we will we'll do more in the future and we have huge scope on expanding that. I think uh, that, that is the preliminary remarks that I want to just add on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Lamsal. Uh, I turn to Ambassador Momin and um, you mentioned BBIN which is Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal and connectivity between these four countries. Uh, I'd request you to talk a little bit about this idea. Uh, I don't think there are many in this room who are aware of it, so I'd like you to speak a little bit about it. But also I'd like to ask you about BIMSEC, the Bay of Bengal uh, Multisectoral Economic Cooperation uh, Project, and if you could help us in understanding both these ideas. Thank you, uh, um, Ambassador Gautam. I mean, these are not new ideas. Uh, BBIN has been... Uh, uh, in the offing for some time now, uh, Bhutan had uh, some hesitancy, so uh, we decided to move along and when Bhutan uh, uh, is comfortable, they can always join. So, uh, I think… Uh, is, is this purely road connectivity or it also uh, it's expands mostly, to railways? Uh, road network, the, you know, uh, the mutual agreements that are uh, required for recognition of the driving licenses and the physical movement of trucks and uh, other vehicles. So, uh, uh, I think next month we'll be having a conference, big conference in Dhaka to push uh, forward this idea and uh, hopefully uh, by this year we should be able to see uh, its implementation, uh, at least uh, amongst uh, Bhutan, uh, sorry, amongst uh, India, uh, Nepal and Bangladesh. Uh, you mentioned uh, 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 BIMSTEC, but before that I would just uh, like to uh, say and touch upon the, the SAFTA and SAFTA Plus that was mentioned by Ambassador Quatra. And uh, the least developed countries amongst uh, the South, Asi uh, I mean, uh, South Asian countries, uh, namely Bhutan, uh, Nepal, and, and Bangladesh, uh, they uh, benefited a lot uh, because of the exemptions and the you know, uh, facilities that was provided by India. And as a result, uh, as was also mentioned, that the, now the, uh, the bilateral trade between uh, India and Bangladesh is uh, uh, 16 uh, billion plus. Uh, and, and growing all the time. Uh, uh, initially, Bangladesh export to India was a little less, but that is also now uh, picking up. So, uh, and for that, uh, we are grateful. Uh, but now that uh, 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 the neighbors of India are also graduating uh, from the LDC category, uh, namely again, uh, Bhutan, uh, Nepal, and Bangladesh. So we have to uh, look uh, forward uh, to uh, working on uh, new arrangements uh, with Bangladesh, uh, the SEPA, uh, the Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement is also being uh, talked about. So, uh, in the coming uh, coming uh, months and, and uh, if not uh, years, we should be able to do this so that uh, uh, when we officially graduate uh, by 2026 uh, and then uh, some of the um, uh, support measures will be uh, taken out uh, by European Union and others in 2029. So uh, this transition we have to work uh, double time uh, so that uh, it, it remains uh, a more uh, smooth uh, operation. As far as uh, BIMSTEC is concerned, uh, we uh, are going to assume the chairmanship of uh, BIMSTEC uh, uh, hopefully in November. And we have a new Secretary General, uh, 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 an Indian uh, diplomat, senior diplomat, uh, Ambassador Indra uh, uh, Pandey, and we have been discussing, you know, how Bangladesh's uh, chairmanship uh, will take this uh, organization uh, forward. And uh, since we host the secretariat, so we have already started our own brainstorming uh, sessions, and uh, we have uh, from Brimstake, there is this eminent persons group. They also held their first meeting in Dhaka, so hopefully uh, they can submit uh, their vision of uh, reform or revitalization of BIMSTEC, which is now, I think, crossing the adolescence. So now we should take advantage of this. So we, we have uh, some ideas uh, uh, already, 
like uh, we should be concluding the operationalizing the BIMSTEC FTA, which is there again uh, for some time. Uh, formal launching of the Blue Economy Action Plan and activating or mobilizing the Blue Economy Expert Group. Uh, finalization and implementation of the Agreement on Maritime Transport Cooperation. Uh, operationalizing the grid interconnectivity and regional energy trade uh, with emphasis on renewable energy. And also, uh, as was mentioned by Ambassador Quattro, the introduction of cross-border digital economy or uh, digital uh, platform uh, networks and, and uh, gateways. I mean, bilaterally, India is doing it, but maybe as a, as a group, uh, BIMSTEC can provide that uh, platform. Um, these are uh, some of the ideas that uh, we will be pushing, and also the idea that uh, um, India is uh, the lead country for uh, security energy issues. Bangladesh, uh, trade and investment and development, Nepal, people-to-people -people contact. So uh, we can form, uh, you know, subgroups or, you know, groups to, who want to push uh, particular ideas uh, uh, amongst all the other issues. And uh, there are new issues like uh, circular economy mentioned by Ambassador Quatra, solar alliance, disaster resilience and prevention of pollution, youth-centric programs and skill development as was mentioned by uh, my Nepali counterpart. So all these, uh, you know, uh, contours can be fully utilized, uh, hopefully, uh, in the coming years. Uh, last but not the least, I would also like to mention, as uh, uh, taking clue from uh, Ambassador Quatra, that India has been helping uh, its neighbors through uh, the uh, line of credits. A lot of projects have been taken, but we have also seen uh, there are some, uh, you know, uh, delays or constraints or uh, bottlenecks in the disbursement and the implementation. And when uh, 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 Honorable Foreign Minister Jay Shankar met our uh, Prime Minister recently in Munich, he mentioned that we can always revisit some of these old projects which uh, were not implemented. So uh, aligning the priority of the two countries and also thinking of the uh, greater uh, uh, picture that, that we have in mind. So uh, that, that could be Bangladesh being one of uh, the largest, I think, recipient of the LOC, so uh, again, uh, thanks to India. And uh, we have seen uh, how uh, India's uh, policy of neighborhood first works uh, firsthand uh, when Bangladesh was invited in the G20 uh, uh, forum and the framework, and uh, we tried our best to uh, come with our uh, you know, experience uh, uh, of uh, the development trajectory that we have envisaged. So uh, I think uh, we have the light kind of leadership amongst uh, us, so it is up to us, the diplomats, and also the private sector and the business to deliver. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have completely run out of time for this session, so I'll bring it to an end, but my main takeaway, and I don't know if all of you agree with me, is that a lot is being done to economically integrate our region, which is South Asia. And thank you very much, Ambassador Quatra, Foreign Secretary of India, Ambassador Lamsal, Foreign Secretary of Nepal, Ambassador Momin, Foreign Secretary of Bangladesh, for coming to Pune. We have a much better understanding of our region, thanks to all that you have said. Thank you very much for being with us, and thank you to the audience for listening so patiently. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Um, can I just ask um, Ambassador Gautam Bambavle to offer a small token of appreciation to each of the ambassadors on the stage, please? To Ambassador Masood bin Moman and to Ambassador Mine, uh, Vinay Mohan Quatra. Let's just get a photo. Thank you so much. And to quote something that Ambassador Lamsal said, if this region comes together, the sum of the parts will be much greater than the whole. So look forward to that happening. <laughs>